PhD in, uh, at the uh, University of Florida in Gainesville, so in 2000 and 2005, right? 2008. So, 2008. Uh, 2008, yeah. So for one year we were sharing the same states because I was uh, finishing my postdoc in Tallahassee, which is a, a few uh, 300 miles north of uh, Gainesville. So uh, with uh, Peter Hirschfeld, he did his PhD. And then he did a sequence of uh, postdocs in uh, New South Wales, in Australia, at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, and uh, ETH in Zurich. And since 2007, he has been a, a, a professor at uh, PUCI Rio de Janeiro. So- 2017, 2017. Uh, Sorry, two, uh, 10 years later, yeah, 2017. Uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to have him here, and uh, he's going to talk about the uh, peculiar spintronic effects caused by spin momentum locking and geometrical confinement. Uh, please, Jen, welcome. Okay, thank you very much for uh, George to... Uh, I would like to thank George for giving me this opportunity to, uh, uh, let's say, talk about our works. Yeah. So in essence, I will be talking about two projects uh, today. Uh, they are sort of related, but not quite. So I'm trying to find a title that they have sharing a common ground. Yeah. So what I think uh, that in both of the systems, one is this kind of um, heterostructure between a topological insulator and a ferromagnet. And the other one is graphene with a spin orbit coupling. So I think both of them would, if I can find the only, let's say, feature that they share at the same time, then it will be a spin momentum locking. Yeah, because you know, topological insulator, because it's protected by time reversal symmetry and all that. So it has spin momentum locking. But on the other hand, this graphene with spin orbit coupling would also have spin orbit coupling. And moreover, I will be talking about uh, for the topological insulator part, it will be a heterostructure with a finite size in the uh, junction direction. Whereas in um, the uh, graphene part, I will actually be talking about nano ribbons. So they are also geometrically confined. So um, in both types of systems, so the common features that they share is the spin momentum locking and geometric confinement. And I would like to show you a few um, let's say, interesting phenomena that we found using a simulation by lattice models. So the first is a rather peculiar claim that uh, a very counterintuitive. Namely, for the topological insulator part, we claim that there is actually no equilibrium edge spin current that uh, keeps running at the boundary. Now, uh, this is very counterintuitive, but I will explain why, why this is happening. And okay, if there's no equilibrium as spin currents, then you know this, um, there's this big motivation in topological spintronics by putting a ferromagnet right next to the topological material, like I was showing you here in this kind of geometry, to intend to, um, let's say, exploit this edge currents to do some spintronic uh, uh, applications. Then since I claim that there's no equilibrium edge current, then how come the uh, topological spintronics still works? So this I will also explain. And then uh, for uh, the graphene nano ribbon part, I will focus on the Rajpath spin orbit coupling and emphasize some strange spintronic effects that we uncovered. Now for the uh, topological insulator part, this work is done with collaboration with Carlos Eguis at USP San Carlos, and also my student Antonio Zegara, who just got his PhD uh, like uh, last week. And uh, for the spintronic effects in graphene nano ribbons, this is a collaboration with Manfred Sigris at ETH3 and my other PhD student, uh, Matthias de Souza at PUC. So in part one, I would like to talk about the, uh, the, our results in topological insulators. Now, first is it the claim of the absence of equilibrium uh, edge current in, let's say in 2D topological insulators in general. 
Now, the easiest system to demonstrate this phenomena is this so-called 2D churn insulators. So churn insulators are uh, this kind of time reversal breaking two-dimensional systems. And because of the time reversal symmetry breaking, it is believed that you have an uh, edge state that is counter-propagating at the two opposite edges. And from this, you will naturally uh, expect that because you have a, your ground state contains a edge state that keeps running at the edge, right? So naturally, you will expect that there will be an equilibrium edge current. Uh, it's kind of like a persistent current. Now, you don't need to do anything. You prepare a sample, you put it on the table, there will be a current that keeps running. Now, I would like to examine this phenomena using the following uh, procedure. I say that I start from the uh, continuous Dirac model that is suitable for the 2D churn insulator. Um, I extend it to the whole brilliant zone because I would like to study this in a real, real space lattice model. So uh, for churn insulator, for instance, these gamma matrices in the Dirac model are just the poly matrices, two by two poly matrices. And the part that is linear in momentum, once you regularize into the operating zone, becomes a sign of the momentum. And the mass term, you, you also have to regularize it to add some uh, higher order term uh, in, in order to avoid the uh, fermion doubling. And then you can do a Fourier transform of this Hamiltonian to real space and construct a tight binding model. So this is uh, absolutely straightforward. And then you, then we study this geometry because I want to study an edge curve, right? So I open up, so I choose a periodic boundary condition in X direction and open boundary condition in Y direction, such that eventually I will have a ribbon. So because I have a ribbon, the momentum along the X direction is a good quantum number, but in Y direction, it is quantized because it's like a particle in a box in the Y direction because it is open. So you see that the band structure is like this. It's like a continuous band, but there are many, many bands, which depends on the width in the y direction. So here, the color code of the band structure uh, represents a wave function at the right edge and the wave function at the left edge for a specific eigenstate. Let's say, for instance, for this particular eigenstate of momentum, some momentum k and some band index ny, uh, I color the wave function according to it is more, it is closer to the left edge or it is closer to the right edge. So here you see that indeed you have the red that is uh, closer to one edge and moreover it has a positive group velocity. So that means you do have a edge state that is running uh, at this edge in a positive direction. And this green is the uh, edge state at the other edge and you see that it has a negative group velocity. So it is exactly what I was saying. So it, uh, it gives you uh, electrons that are moving in the uh, negative direction. However, besides this, you see that these bulk bands, which usually people don't care because they say that, well, they are far away from uh, chemical potential, right? So usually people, people ignore these uh, bulk bands. But in this lattice model, we actually found that these bulk bands are actually also spin polarized. As you can see that, for instance, this one is also a little bit red, meaning that these states are also very much localized at the right edge, even though they are not edge states, they are the bulk, they are the valence band, quantized valence band states. But the interesting thing is, you see that it actually has a negative group velocity, which is opposite of these ones of the edge states. You see that this is a positive slope, but this is a negative slope. So this seems to indicate that the bulk bands also produces an edge current that is in flowing in the opposite direction as the uh, uh, as the as the edge state. So uh, to quantify this, we just simply go ahead and calculate the equilibrium current, which is just the expectation value of a current operator multiplied by the Fermi function. Then what we see is this uh, very following phenomena. If you, if in this summation of the states, you only include these uh, edge states near chemical potential, then indeed you got positive edge at one, positive current at one edge and negative current at the other edge. So here I'm plotting the edge current as a fu function of, um, actually I'm plotting the total current everywhere as a function of a transverse coordinate, yeah. 
So, however, if you include all the states and multiply by the framing function, so in other words, you basically you include all the uh, states that are filled uh, below the chemical potential, including the edge states and also the valence bands, you see that the current actually vanishes everywhere. Yeah. And moreover, uh, this statement is actually very general. It, it is independent of whatever parameters I put here. You see, here I have growth velocity, which is basically determined by this uh, uh, the, the, this parameter A, and then I have the, this bulk band de determined by the mass time M. And I have all the other parameters, and I also I can change the width of this uh, of this ribbon that I'm simulating. But this statement is completely general. The current contributed from all the bands is actually zero. And so this means that the mechanism is that this uh, valence band quantized states are producing a charge current that is negative of what the edge state produces. However, this, anal uh, this uh, analysis also immediately implies that uh, if you put the chemical potential away from the Dirac point, then you can have a finite equilibrium edge current. This is because, um, so my, what I was telling you in the previous slide, this exact cancellation between the edge state and the bulk bands happens only when the chemical potential is exactly at the Dirac point. So if you put a chemical potential a little bit below the Dirac point, then the interesting thing is you count all the bulk bands, but some part of these edge states you did not count, right? Because they are above chemical potential. So this means that some currents from the edge states will be missing. So in other words, you are gonna have a negative current. So likewisely, if you put a chemical potential above the Dirac point, then everything below the Dirac point is canceled. But in addition to that, you have these two branches that are contributing to some finite edge current, right? So in this case, you are gonna have a positive edge current. So in other words, if you sweep chemical potential from negative to positive, you actually see the currents going from negative to zero and then to positive. Yeah. So in other words, you can use the chemical potential to switch the edge current from running clockwise to running counterclockwise. Yeah. And besides this, you also see this kind of step, uh, stairwise structures in this uh, uh, edge current versus chemical potential. So this turns out to be because we do the simulation on a small, uh, you know, small finite size of a lattice. So the current is actually geometrically quantized because because of the uh, because of the system size. So these steps are not universal because it, it will depend on the. Uh, size of your lattice simulation. So from this, we can imagine, a, let's say, experimental proposal, how you can measure this kind of switching of the or reversal of the edge current by chemical potential. Because I can imagine that you, you produce some kind of a churn insulated quantum dot, and then you put it on some kind of metallic uh, thin films that serves a, as a big gate. So once you tune this um, chemical potential by applying a voltage on the back gate, you can um, ch change the uh, edge current in the churn insulator, as I say, from running clockwisely to co running counterclockwisely. And you may, in principle, be, made, be able to measure this um, uh, direction of the current by measuring the magnetic field that it produces. Yeah. So this, uh, this should, at least it's a Gedanken experiment that should be possible to do. Or the other way to do is what they, uh, what they did in experiments. They just dope the system uh, such that they change the chemical potential from below the Dura point, which they call it P type, to above the Dura point, which they call it N type. Yeah. So this, you can also change the direction of flow. Now, that is the uh, 2D churn insulator that breaks the time reversal symmetry. Now, in real topological insulators, in most of the materials, we have time reversal symmetry. So what you are expecting is, for instance, in this uh, prototype topological insulator, time reversal invariant uh, one, the so-called Bernabic Hughes sound model or BHZ model, it is essentially two copies of churn insulators, one for spinning up and the other one for spin down. So as you can see here, at this edge, the spin up, which is the blue 
arrow and spin down, which is a green arrow, they are running in the opposite directions. And at the other edge, it, uh, it is completely reversed. Yeah. So because at this edge, you have spin up running forward, spin down running backwards. So naturally, you will expect that there will be an equilibrium edge spin current occurring in this system. So however, uh, according to the same logic, I take a continuous model that you know mimics this um, uh, time reversal invariant situation, uh, where the representation of these Dirac matrices will be a little bit different. But the logic is the same. You choose the one that is appropriate for this symmetry class. You extend this linear uh, Dirac uh, Dirac Hamiltonian to lattice model, and then you Fourier transform into real space to construct a lattice model. And actually, this procedure you can find in many textbooks about topological insulators. There's absolutely nothing new. But what is new is the claim that uh, the bands, the valence bands that you often ignore, actually gives you non-trivial effects. For instance, here I'm plotting the spin-up component of the wave function at the right edge and spin-down component of the wave function at the same right edge. So I'm only focusing on the right edge. So you see that once again, you have a spin up running forward, spin down running backwards. But the bulk bands are doing exactly opposite. Yeah. So once you sum over all the occupied states, the result is the same. If your uh, chemical potential sits exactly at zero, then the spin current will be zero. Yeah. So, in, in, so you, if your chemical potential sits exactly at these Dirac points, then you have an exact cancellation from the uh, valence bands and the uh, edge states and giving you no edge current at the end. Uh, however, if you uh, put your chemical potential away from the Dirac point, then you will start to have a finite edge spin current. And moreover, the spin current switches sign as your uh, chemical potential goes from negative to positive. Yeah. So all that I wanted to say up to now is that Edge state does not necessarily imply an edge current. These are two different things. And in fact, these uh, bulk bands, they are trying to do something non-trivial to you know, cancel out your contribution from the, uh, from the uh, edge states. Now, this is, of course, uh, in this very simple-minded um, regular, regularized uh, lattice model. Yeah? As I say, I start from the uh, from the uh, uh, continuous model, I regularize it to the whole breathing zone and then I Fourier transform it to the real lattice model. So does this really happen in real materials? I mean, in real materials, for instance, 2D topological insulators like uh, this kind of monolayer transition metal like charcoal genine materials like MOS2, their band structure, okay, it has some similar feature as this one I've shown you before. You have, they have the edge states and but the bulk bands look so different, right? So uh, does it really happen in, in real materials? Well, more works needed to be done. For instance, maybe one can use some kind of um, uh, uh, density, density functional theory to, to try to nail this down and to see if this phenomenon actually happens in real materials. Okay, now since I have claimed that there is no equilibrium edge state, now, how does this kind of topological spintronics, which you try to, uh, uh, let's say, put a ferromagnetic material right next to your topological insulator, why you see all this kind of fascinating uh, phenomena, such as current-induced spin torque that I will introduce in a few minutes? So why does this work? Well, to do this kind of um, uh, situation, first we investigate what happens to the band structure of uh, this kind of um, uh, this kind of heterostructure yeah so but while investigating the band structure we realize that there's also um, an important um, principle that is uh, at least we think that is not that much often emphasized this is the so-called shocking mark rule so the topological insulators although we call it an insulator, but from an energetic point of view, it's more like a semiconductor because the band gap is usually around something like 400, 500 millivolts or so. So when you put a, 
uh, uh, semiconductor in conjunction with a uh, ferromagnetic metallic material, then it has been known in the semiconductor business for a long time that when you put these two materials together, what has to align together at the interface is the work function of these two materials. So as a result, your chemical potential of these two materials can be adjusted according to the work function of the two materials. So as, you, uh, as shown here, as schematically as some kind of band bending uh, at, at the semiconductor side. So precisely how it would bend would depend on precisely what two materials are you are uh, using to make these junctions, right? But we think that in principle, you can distinguish two kinds of situations. The first kind is what we call the pristine type of band structure, where you see that, so I, I, I'm again going to consider uh, a periodic boundary condition in X direction and open boundary condition in Y for this, and in this kind of side-by-side -side junction situation as I'm showing you on the screen. So the band structure uh, schematically looks like this. You have the topological insulator bands, so which are this one on the top and this one on the bottom, and in the middle, you see the Dirac, uh, you see the Dirac cone. So, um, but in addition to that, the ferromagnets, they themselves, they have this kind, kind of cosine-like bands because they are the usual metallic uh, systems, right? So if you zoom in, look at the low energy part, you see that uh, what happens is that this Dirac cone is actually, okay, it, 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 it actually survives but it gradually merges into the ferromagnetic ball bands. Yeah. However, we think that there can be other kind of situation that the shifting at the, of chemical potential at the interface is such that the Dirac cone actually merges into the ferromagnetic ball bands. So like, like here, that I'm showing you here. If you zoom in at low energy, you see that it is actually kind of hard to distinguish the Dirac cone because it is so so much intertwined with the ferromagnetic bands that it's even ambiguous to, to say where is the Dirac, where is the Dirac cone. Yeah. So at least there are two kinds of situations that we can uh, distinguish. Now, uh, we wanted to study what happens to the edge states, right? So we look at the, um, let's say, and, and in, in addition to this, you have the di direction of the magnetization because in principle, you can you know, change the direction of the magnetization, this uh, red arrow here, to any direction by, let's say, applying a magnetic field. So um, let's look at the situation when the, um, when the magnetization is pointing along the spin quantization axis of the edge state, which is out of plane along Z direction. So again, I have two kinds of situation, the pristine case and the submerged case. So for the pristine case, you can kind of trace out what happens to the uh, edge state, right? Because uh, the Dirac cone is still so so obvious, uh, even though it's, it, is, it is highly distorted. So what we found is that if you look at the wave function, three points, the black and the blue, so here I'm plotting a wave function as a function of transverse coordinate. So at the left of this dashed line is the topological insulator part, and on the right hand side is the ferromagnetic uh, metal part. So you see that closer to the Dirac point, the wave function still very much look like the edge state. But if you move gradually to the ferromagnetic bands, then it gradually merges to the uh, ferromagnetic wave function which, because the ferromagnet is sandwiched between this topological insulator and the other side, let's say, is a vacuum. So it kind of is like a particle in a box. It's a quantum well, basically. Yeah. So the wave function is basically just a standing wave. So you, you can see that it's, this, is, this is basically a standing wave or particle in a box. And for this submerged type as well, although it's kind of hard to distinguish where exactly is the Dirac point, or Dirac cone, but we can still just, let's say, for instance, look at this band that gradually merges to the ferromagnetic power bands, and you see the wave function. They are even more intertwined with the uh, quantum well states, which now you see it has two, you can have higher harmonics of this um, particle in the box states, right, which has two antinodes. 
Okay, so they are very much intertwined, and you can look at other spin directions, other magnetization directions as well. For instance, you put magnetization along the along x direction, which is now perpendicular to the spin quantization axis of the edge state. And what we found, the information here is that um, it seems like the spin expectation value inside the um, topological insulator of the edge states will actually be, will actually be affected. For instance, nicely uh, without any uh, proximity effect, the spin of the topological insulator is 100% polarized in z direction, like this. But you see, because of a conjunction with uh, ferromagnet, it induces a small uh, negative um, uh, sigma x component. And here as well, for the submerged case, you see this kind of phenomena is even more severe. You will induce a large uh, sigma x polarization for the edge state. So this simply means that the spin momentum locking of the edge state is no longer perfect. Because if it is perfect, it's going to be 100% polarized in Z. But because of proximity effect to this uh, ferromagnet, you will be distorted. You will be twisted to some other direction. Okay, so these are at least some important effects uh, in this kind of heterostructures. And then the other thing is we also found that uh, just by looking at the band structure, you see immediately that this band structure is actually not symmetric between positive kx and negative kx, which is pretty obvious. For instance, this feature at the positive kx and negative kx you don't have. So this seems to imply that the electrons running forward and the electrons running backwards in your whole Fermi C is not really symmetric, it's not the same. So because of this, we naturally speculate that there might be some persistent uh, charge current that is running in this system. Yeah. So to do this, once again, it's very simple. You just take the charge current operator and then you calculate the expectation value of this. And indeed, we see that <clears throat> as a function of transverse coordinate, the charge current, uh, you induce the charge current uh, mainly localized near the interface in, in, at this BHC and ferromagnet. Yeah. So I plot it as a transverse coordinate, uh, the charge current. For either the pristine or the submerged type of band structures, you see that this occurs. So indeed, this kind of asymmetric band structure will produce uh, what we call laminar charge current because the charge current is not always positive or it's not always negative. It is sometimes positive I mean, and sometimes negative. And also before I have told you that the BHZ model itself does not produce uh, equilibrium spin current because of the cancellation from the bulk bands, right? But here we found that if you make it in conjunction with this ferromagnet, then because of the proximity effect, you can induce a finite edge spin curve. You see that this is highly localized at the interface, and it's true for either, either kind of band structure. So the physical picture is you have this kind of junction, right? And depending on your direction of magnetization, you can produce this kind of persistent laminar current. In some region, it runs positive. In some region, it runs negative but uh, it is mainly localized at the interface. And this persistent current has both persistent charge current and persistent spin currents. Uh, and also to draw relevance with the um, spintronic applications in this kind of, kind of uh, heterostructures, we wanted to study this, what is called the current induced spin torque. So the idea is the following. Uh, in this kind of heterostructures, you can apply a bias voltage in the x direction, in the longitudinal direction. And what experimental is found that you can actually, and this bias voltage actually produces a spin torque on the magnetization of the ferromagnet. Now, uh, we wanted to study this uh, situation. So uh, the explanation is the following. Once you apply a bias voltage, or equivalently you apply an external electric field to the system, you can generate a spin polarization in the whole heterostructure. 
Uh, and this spin polarization, you can calculate because it's a susceptibility. We call it magnetoelectric susceptibility because it's a spin polarization induced by electric field. So you can calculate this using the simple linear response theory because it is uh, on this side it's electric field, right? So you put a current current operator here, and on the other side you want to calculate spin. So you got to put in spin here, and then you have the usual correlator and multiply a function that looks like a, that, is, that is essentially the derivative of the Fermi function. And if this um, spin polarization has some component that is not perpendicular, sorry, that is not parallel to the uh, magnetization, then you're going to have a spin torque because of the landau uh mechanism. Yeah? And moreover, I will only count the part that the spin polarization that's inside ferromagnet because only the ferromagnet has the uh, magnetization. Okay, so we did this, we calculated it using our lattice model, and indeed we see uh, this kind of pro spatial profile of the uh, magnetoelectric sensibility, which I, we identify two things. First of all, at this edge, so this is the edge that is uh, of the topological insulator that is not in contact with the ferromagnet, so it's a free edge. So you see that it has a uh, spin polarization as well, and this is the so-called Edelstein effect uh, that has also been uh, seen in the experiment. And this we can capture in, in, in our approach. And this part that is inside this film magnet um, uh, is precisely what causes uh, the spin torque. And here we are plotting it different lines are different at different interface coupling. Yeah. And we pre present it for both pristine type and submerged type of band structure. So our conclusion is the following. We found that the spin torque is mainly field light, by which field light we mean it's along the direction of magnetization cross the spin quantization axis of the edge state, which is Z direction. So this form of the torque is usually called the field light torque. And moreover, in the literature, there has been a huge debate that does this torque come from the edge state or does it come from the ferromagnetic states themselves because they might be distorted and affected in a way, right? And our linear response says that it actually comes from both. And in, uh, in, oftentimes it is even hard to rigorously define what you mean by edge state and ferromagnetic states because as I was showing you earlier, the band structure is such that they are so much intertwined that oftentimes it's even hard to say where is your Dirac point and where is your, does your Dirac point still exist or does it just you know completely merge into this ferromagnetic bands. Okay, and uh, here just to show you some relevant experiments that has been done in the literature. Um, the more promising geometry is that you put this. Um, so they use this 2D transition dichargogenide materials, which are uh, time reversal invariant topological insulators. And instead of putting it side by side with the ferromagnet, usual, the usual geometry is that you put it on top of this uh, 2D, uh, 2D uh, system, right? So we can also study this, and we are studying this right now, but uh, we haven't had any results yet. So the experimental uh, conclusion is that they seem to see a large field like torque, ah, which we were very happy to see this um, because this seems to be in agreement with our results. But it turns out that if you look carefully, how they, what they call field like torque is not really the same as how, how we call it. Because so here this is um, the spin torque as um, analyzed in their experiments in one of these experimental papers where M is uh, the magnetization, which is the S in our theory. Yeah. And you see that their cross border is always defined with respect to the Y direction. Now this has a historical reason because uh, people think that this is very similar to the so-called spin orbit torque, uh, in which now you define the field like and damping like according to the Y direction. So our message to the experimentalists is that, you know, the spin torque caused by the topological insulator is better defined with respect to the z-axis because the spin momentum locking is not the same as the usual 
spin spin orbit torque situation. So it, it makes more sense to define it with respect to the z direction as we as we do here. Yeah. And then you can analyze it again and see if you see the fuel line or damping line torque. So okay, now uh, I will not uh, because I, I, for the interest of time, I will not talk too much about three D topological insulators. But I will just flash the results quickly because uh, we see very similar results. So three D topological insulators. It is. Uh, you expect to see this kind of surface uh, spin currents uh, that is running, uh, that is wrapping around all its all its sur surfaces, right? And then once again, we wanted to see that if these surface states also produce uh, equilibrium surface spin current. So we do exactly the same thing. We take the continuous model, we extend it to the whole Brillouin zone, and Fourier transform it to get a lattice model. And our conclusion is once again the same thing. You will see that the um, the uh, bulk bands produces an equilibrium current that is contrast that is in the opposite direction of the edge state uh, surface spin current, and at the end you you also see that if your chemical potential is exactly at the dual point, then you don't see any you don't see any current. There's no equilibrium current. There's only finite current if you put chemical potential away from it, and also positive and negative. Uh, chemical potential have opposite sides of uh, surface spin curve, exactly as the ones I was showing you before. And also, we can also uh, put a thin film of ferromagnet on top of this. So we study this kind of uh, atomic layers of um, 3D Ti and also a ferromagnetic metal using a lattice model. And we see that uh, because now in the thin film geometry, both kx and ky are good quantum numbers, right? It's just the z direction is quantized. So you got a band structure that looks like this, which is this kind of lasagna look like um, uh, band structures. Yeah. And this is what we call the pristine type, where you see that the Dirac, uh, Dirac cone is uh, outside of the uh, these ferromagnetic bands. And you can also have the submerged type where the Dirac cone just totally uh, comes into the ferromagnetic bands. And once again, the percolation of the wave function is very similar. Once you go gradually uh, from the Dirac cone state to the ferromagnetic state, you see that it gradually becomes these uh, ferromagnetic uh, quantum well states. And also, uh, we see that the band structure is once again asymmetric if you put the magnetization in the right direction. So this, once again, speculates the existence of a persistent charge current, and we do the simulation and indeed see that there is a persistent current that keeps running at this kind of uh, system. And also, although the 3D TI themselves do not have a, a spin edge, a surface spin current, but once you put it in conjunction with the ferromagnet, this spin current will occur. And so the physical picture is like this. You have this kind of atomic layers, right? But you, you would produce this kind of laminar persistent current that runs, you know, like a planar current that runs in a certain direction. Right. Okay, and we also use a linear response theory, exactly the same linear response theory, but just uh, translated into 3D systems in which we can also see the Edelstein effect at the free edge and the spin torque inside the ferromagnet. And then another interesting thing is you can compare, you can also put in some impurities into, into this system, right? And then you see that the impurities actually have a dramatic effect on the magnitude of the Edelstein effect and the spin torque. And this is consistent with uh, an analytical calculation I did earlier using the Boltzmann transfer equation. So, but uh, the info information here is uh, similar, that the spin torque is mainly field-like. And also, both the uh, edge state and the field magnetic states contribute to the torque. And oftentimes, it's even ambiguous to distinguish these two kinds of states. Okay, to make a comparison with the experiment, actually, this is a super exciting experiment um, that is done in 2014 that they actually take a 3D topological insulator, the pr prototype one, this bismuth selenide, and on top you put the uh, prototype ferromagnetic metal, the permaloid, and 
what they found is that uh, they indeed see this kind of current induced spin torque. And moreover, what they see is that oftentimes this kind of uh, spin torque can even outperform the usual spin orbit spin torque uh, geometry, where instead of a uh, topological insulator, you put a heavy metal like platinum, tantalum, or, uh, or uh, beta tungsten, and so on. So this is very exciting. It, it, this seems to indicate that the topological insulators may be even a better uh, material to produce a spin torque, at least in some situations. However, the experimentalists also find that there's a large damping-like component. So this theta parallel is essentially a parameter for the damping-like component. So this is in contrast to our findings because we, we claim that in this kind of percolation, uh, this simple model, of lattice model of 3D TI and the ferromagnet, seems like the torque is mainly field-like. So we think that uh, the large damping light torque that they observed in the experiments may be due to some other effects that we do not take into account. And in, indeed, there are plenty of other theories about the microscopic mechanisms of this, uh, of this spin torque. So we do not claim that we have uh, a theory of everything for this, uh, for, for this spin torque, but the only thing that we can a claim is that if you only count the percolation of the edge states, then uh, it seems like the contribution is entirely feel like. Okay, that finished my first part of the talk. And for the second part of the talk, which I will keep it a little bit shorter, I will be talking about graphene nano ribbons with a large fast spin orbit carbon. So, uh, so I have a graphene, uh, let's say a hexagonal lattice. Um, model and I have some hopping. Um, um, uh, I have some uh, hopping uh, on this uh, hexagonal lattice, and I also have this form of spin orbit coupling, which is essentially rush by interaction. You regularize it on the honeycomb lattice, and in addition to that, I will assume that this uh, system has a magnetization because, for instance, you put it on some magnetic substrate. And there's an exchange interaction between the magnetization S and the spin of the electrons in the graphene. So in an infinite graphene, uh, let's forget about the magnetization for a moment. Just look at the effect of the rush bar spin orbit coupling. Then just like the, in the usual two-dimensional metallic compounds, you also see that the, uh, the uh, graphene bands have been splitted because the spin degeneracy has been has been lifted, so so you have it, it looks like a kind of uh, band structure here. So these two sheets are very close to each other, and these two sheets are very close to each other. And in the, addition to that, you know that there are these uh, Dirac points. So um, this spin orbit coupling will cause a spin momentum locking, uh, as that I'm showing you here. So here, what I'm plotting is the. Uh, spin expectation value of the eigenstates of one of these bands, I think it's E1, uh, and I plot it as a function of momentum. So you see that the rush bar interaction causes an in-plane uh, quantization, uh, uh, spin polarization for the eigenstates, and it has a texture that looks like this. So the important message here is that around K and K prime point, you see that the vorticity is positive, it is like a how to say this is clockwise, yeah? And we're in the center, the vorticity is actually counterclockwise. So this is very different from the usual uh, spin momentum locking in the two deck. Now, if you further put a magnetization into the system, then the magnetization is gonna deform this, uh, it's gonna deform this uh, uh, spin momentum locking because some part of this, the spin uh, polarization that is parallel to the magnetization will become energetically more favorable. So this whole thing will be deformed for energetic reasons. So uh, yes, so I, I, I'm gonna have a spin momentum locking for, for this system. And then uh, we want to investigate the situation when you started to open up an edge. And in this talk, I will focus particularly on the zigzag edge part, which is X direction is open boundary condition and Y direction is continuous. 
because the y direction is this zigzag, uh, is this zigzag edge that you can see, right? And we wanted to investigate the spin currents um, produced uh, in the system. Now, spin currents uh, has two indices. One is the direction of polarization, and the other one is the direction of flow. So, which one I call upper index, and the other one is lower index. And it is known that the rush bar interaction itself can cause a persistent spin current. And this is actually proposed by rush bar in 2003. Yeah, and, and this is actually very intuitive to argue because you see that in this pattern of spin momentum locking, though uh, the momentum uh, that, that is, uh, let's say, a, a state that is momentum ky, it is uh, spin quantized in the x direction, right? So the particles moving in the y direction would be spin polarizing x. So naturally, you would expect that there will be a persistent uh, spin polarization running, persistent spin current that is running uniformly in the bulk. Now, this is what we call JXY and JYX, and both of them are there. Um, yeah, you can see that this is, uh, for instance, this JXY is spin polarizing X and is running along Y direction. So here I'm plotting, uh, because the nano ribbon is translationally invariant along the ribbon direction, right? So I only need to plot one slice of this cross section of this uh, nano ribbon, which is what I'm showing you here. And you indeed see that this current that keeps running along the ribbon direction. And it is uh, kind of centering at the edge. I mean, at the edge, it has a larger magnitude. And this, this one as well. So this one is uh, opposite because it tends to run in the same direction. However, in addition to this uh, uniform, or let's say supposedly uniform uh, spin current, we also found another kind of out-of-plane polarized helical edge spin current. Now, this is very similar to the quantum spin hole effect in the BHZ uh, model that we were showing you earlier. Yeah. So the uh, the edge state of the topological insulators are expected to um, produce a edge spin current. Although I have shown that they do not exist because of the contribution from the bulk bands. But nevertheless, there um, the feature is very much similar. Yeah. So here we found that this this is graphene nano ribbons with rush bar spin orbit coupling. It is not topological. The system is entirely metallic or semi-metallic. Nevertheless, it still has uh, this helical edge spin curve. Now, to give an argument why they exist, we look at the wave function of the bands. Yeah, so the bands look like this because the ribbon goes in y direction, so the momentum ky is a good quantum number. And the x direction is quantized, so you have this uh, the, the, the bands that look like this. So what we found is that uh, now we plot the spin up wave function at the left edge and spin down wave function at the right edge, oh, sorry, at the, at the left edge uh, as a color code on the band structure. Then you see that uh, the information is that whenever you have a momentum, whenever the positive ky state has a spin up at the left edge, the negative ky state always have a spin down at the same left edge. So this simply means that at the same edge, you have a spin up running in one direction and spin down running in the other direction. And therefore, naturally, you will expect that they will, you will have this kind of out plane polarized helical edge spin curve. Despite that, there's no topological at all. This is um, entirely an effect of the rush bar spin orbit coupling. Then, uh, in, and in addition to that, we also found another mechanism to produce an uh, edge charge current. So it goes like this, and it turns out that this edge charge current is, can be either chiral or non-chiral. That's actually very interesting. So we found that if you have a nano ribbon and you put a magnetization uh, in a direction perpendicular to the y, to the nano ribbon, yeah, because the ribbon goes along y, so I put a magnetization along x. In this situation, because of the distortion of the spin momentum locking, the band structure becomes uh, asymmetric be between positive ky and negative ky, as you can see obviously here. So once again, this will imply that the 
in the in your Fermi C, the electrons running in positive direction is different from electrons running uh, backwards, right? So we found that indeed you will produce a persistent charge current as the pattern that I'm showing you here. But the interesting thing is that this charge current is actually symmetric. So in other words, they run along the same direction at the two edges. So it's entirely symmetric. So it's non-chiral. Yeah, so this situation is non-chiral. However, you have another situation that is if the magnetization, instead of pointing perpendicular to the ribbon, it points out the plane. In this situation, the band structure is entirely symmetric. But we found that if you plot the wave function uh, of the eigenstate and see that whether they are more localized at the right edge or more localized at the left edge, what you see is the following. Whenever you have a positive ky state that is more localized at the left edge, the negative ky state is always more localized at the opposite edge. So in other words, you will have counter-propagating charges at the two edges. And naturally, you will expect a chiral edge curve. So, for instance, at this edge, you run upwards, and at this edge, you run downwards. Yeah. So here, what I'm saying is that you have, according to the direction of magnetization, you have different mechanisms to create uh, edge current, and sometimes it can be chiral, and sometimes it can be non-chiral. Now, in addition to that, we also found another very interesting phenomenon that we call it. Uh, magnetoelectric torque. It is an equilibrium spin torque that does not require any bias voltage. So the story goes like this. So if you have a nano ribbon and you apply a magnetic magnetic field, for instance, you will expect that the a spin polarization will be entirely along the magnetic field, right? But it turns out that this is not true. If you have a spin orbit coupling and you have a finite geometric confinement, that you have a finite width of the ribbon. For instance, here I'm showing you that if the magnetization points along Z, you can actually produce a spin polarization along X in, in the nano ribbon. And, and whose size is shown uh, here as the color circles. So in other words, you have a kind of transverse spin sensibility. So, uh, so the red is uh, indicating the spin polarization is positive and the blue is spin polarization is negative. And for the other situation as well, let's say if your magnetization points along X and then you can produce a spin polarization along Z. So in other words, once again, this is a transverse spin sensibility. However, this transverse spin sensibility has a very interesting pattern. That is, it is always of opposite sign between the two edges. As you can see, if here is red, and here is always blue, and it's of the same size. If here is blue, and then here is always red. So it is completely symmetric, and it is completely of opposite signs. So in other words, the net spin polarization is zero. Yeah. So the net uh, transverse spin polarization is zero. So as a result, uh, there's no torque. There's no net torque on the magnetization because the two edges cancel out. Um, and in fact, because they, they are of opposite side, right? So the effect is more like a zaloshinsky moria interaction because on one edge, it tends to uh, twist the magnetization in one direction. And at the other edge, it will twist it in the opposite direction. So it kind of bends the magnetization, you know, in the opposite direction to create a non-collinear magnetic order. And this is kind of like a zaloshinsky moria interaction. But so this is, this is interesting, but this is not good enough because we wanted to see if we can create a situation that the net torque is non-zero such that we can use it to flip the magnetization, for instance. So for this, we have two proposals. One possibility is that instead of putting the magnetization in the whole nano ribbon, you just put it closer to one edge. Because if you do it like this, then the other edge will not have effect and, and it will not be canceled out completely. Right? So in this situation, as I'm showing you here, I only put the magnetization on the left of this dash line, where on the right hand side is completely unmagnetized. And indeed, we see that here you can have a finite uh, 
uh, spin polarization. Or you can imagine a nano flake of some irregular shape, because in this kind of irregular shape, it's kind of hard to uh, define the two opposite edges, right? Or the two opposite edges not not really symmetric. So in this kind of situation, indeed, we also see a net finite, a finite net uh, transverse spin polarization. So what we can imagine is this kind of uh, device. Yeah. So. So you imagine you have a graphene nano flake that you put in on some uh, metallic system that serves as a big gate. The idea is that because this torque is completely produced by the geometric confinement and also the rush bar spin orbit coupling. So geometric confinement, you cannot change it too much because that's determined by the shape of the material you, will, you grow, right? But the rush bar spin orbit coupling can be tuned in principle by the applying the electric field. So in other words, you apply a big gate. So we imagine that uh, in this kind of setup, you uh, you have some nano flakes and then you keep applying the gate voltage on this and then you, at some point you can produce a large enough torque to flip this magnetization. So the information here is that this torque is entirely free from the bias voltage. There is no current running through this uh, nano flake. Yeah, it's entirely a big gate. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no, it's not a closed circuit. There's no current. Uh, so this is, a, this is what we propose as a new kind of torque, uh, in addition to all the known um, phenomena such as spin transfer torque or spin orbit torque. Okay, so this brings me to the end of my talk. Now, in summary, I have uh, introduced several phenomena that we have found in a series of papers here. The first is that the uh, there's actually no equilibrium edge spin current or edge charge current in the topological insulators because the bulk bands completely cancels out um, the contribution from the edge states. There's a finite edge spin current only when your chemical potential shifts away from the Dirac point. And also, uh, if you put it in, put the material in conjunction with some ferromagnetic materials, then the percolation of the edge state can cause a finite current. But in this case, the current is a laminar current that flows in both directions and uh, is near the interface. And finally, we see that the uh, this kind of percolation of the edge state would contribute to the edge current that, sorry, contribute to a current induced spin torque that is entirely field-like. And for the second part, I uh, go to the nano ribbons with rush bar spin orbit coupling. The first one is the, to uncover a helical edge spin current, just like in the topological insulators. But that is entirely coming from the rush bar spin orbit coupling. And the system is still metallic. And moreover, you can have chiral or non-chiral edge current depending on uh, the uh, direction of your magnetization. Yeah. And finally, it is a proposal of a new kind of bias-free uh, spin torque, which eventually we call it magnetoelectric torque, that can possibly be induced by a gate voltage. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Wei Chen. Thank you very much for a very, a very nice seminar. Uh, a lot of the results. Um, the, uh, anyone has wants to ask any questions? We are open to, to questions. Um, well, I, I, I do. Uh, who, Edson? Yes. Um, yeah, um, go ahead. Very nice seminar. Very nice talk. Um, but my my question is kind of basic, and I have this uh, question for quite a while. And um, it turns out that uh, the edge state that appear in topological insulator are protected by time reversal symmetry. All right. So yes. now. If by bias voltage, somehow you break time reversal symmetry. How severe is this, uh, is, is this breaking? Or in this case, 
it doesn't uh, it doesn't make any um, it doesn't destroy the edge state. Well, I think this is not really a good picture that what you are saying because when you say that topological insulator is protected by time reversal symmetry, you are talking about a equilibrium system, right? You are talking about an equilibrium situation. You say that time reversal symmetry is protected, but when you apply a bias voltage, this is a non-equilibrium situation. Yeah. So usually if your bias voltage is not too big, then you can think of this problem as, or you can solve this problem by means of Boltzmann equation, for instance, which is to say that your bands are still untouched, but it is, you know, it's slightly shifted. And for this reason, you can produce a, a charge current, or you can produce a spin current, or you can produce a spin torque, as I'm showing you here. So I think it's not really a valid way of thinking about it, yeah, because you are mixing the equilibrium physics with non-equilibrium physics. Yeah, because uh... Because typically, when you say this protected by time reversal symmetry, it means that you have no magnetization of this type of, 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 of physics. But when you include non equilibrium situation, it's a little bit more, it's a different, right? Oh, time reversal symmetry. Yeah. Well, actually, well, I think you are asking many questions at the same time. First of all, when you are attaching it, as I'm showing you here, when you are attaching it to a ferromagnet, the time reversal symmetry of the entire system is already broken rigorously, mm -hmm. right? So that's the first thing. Even if, before you apply a bias voltage, the whole thing has no time reversal symmetry anymore. Then you say that, okay, then what happens if you further apply a bias voltage? And that's all. That, then comes all that to what I'm saying. Because first of all, you have to worry about how the bands are merging to each other how the wave functions are percolating to each other and then you can calculate your whatever you like you can calculate the whatever response coming out of your bias voltage right you can calculate the current it produces you can calculate the spin torque it produces you can calculate anything you like so but the bias should be small right <laughs> Well, in linear, in the sense of linear response theory, yes, then you assume that it is uh, a small bias. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Uh, Eduardo? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Wei, for a very nice talk. Uh, Wei, I just wanted to uh, ask you about this uh, result of uh, absence of uh, current in equilibrium that you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, there is this uh, paper by Franz, Marcel Franz and collaborators, where he talks about what he calls anti chiral modes. So these are systems where both edges have currents in the same direction. And, and he shows that the current, the edge currents in the same direction are canceled by bulk, bulk states, such that in equilibrium, the whole system has no current at all. Uh, I, I have a feeling that you, you have something very similar in your case. Okay, actually it sounds very similar. Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, okay, then we should, uh, I should really read this paper. Yeah, Yeah, I can, I can send it to you. In his case, he, he, he was in a sense required to look at this because if you had two, two uh, modes running in the same direction, it, 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 it looks like you're breaking some time, type of uh, time reversal symmetry. And so, but oh, then he, he discovered that the, the, the bulk modes cancel the edge modes, just like in your case. But, oh, okay. uh, Sounds so, very interesting. Right, but yeah. you see, we, we discovered this entirely based on this, um, this lattice model approach. Sure, and he has a lattice model as well. Oh, ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Then he actually so, works with a Haldane type model. Uh, where he switches some of the phases and then he produces these edge modes which have only one direction like this, but uh -huh. they're, they're can canceled by bulk states as well, just like oh, you okay. described. Okay. But however, I, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you here what is happening in the prototype, in the prototype sure. of logical sure. 
Yeah. So there's nothing fancy. This is your textbook. Um, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Your textbook uh, material. So, 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 so what I'm saying is, is something like it seems like it's frequently overlooked by um, a lot of people. That so, so what I have learned after doing this is that when you talk about any equilibrium uh, properties of topological insulators, you cannot just look at the edge states. The bulk bands are also doing something non-trivial. So that's the let's say uh, the piece of the most important information I got out of out of this. Very good. Um, wait, thanks. wait. Uh, uh, Gerson left a mess, uh, question for you. He had to leave. It's in the chat. If you have you have access to the chat. Right, the I do have time. access to the chat. Let me yeah. see. If you could read it for the for the audience, please. So Gerson asks if someone, okay, if, if this zero current when chemical potential is at zero, so he's once again referred to this uh, absence of equilibrium edge current. He says that if, um, does this zero current when mu is equal to zero is equivalent to the classical result of the current of full bands is zero. Yeah, actually, that's a that's a good question. Um, yes, and then he says that the interesting thing is that you have to account for the edge state as part of the valence band instead of splitting it as an extra band. Yes, actually, I think this uh, this is a simpler explanation because um, we also see that. No, actually, ah, okay, hold on, hold on. I take it back. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. So, okay, let me reply to Gerson's uh, question in the following way. It, it is true that the uh, current of the all the bands together must be zero, but this theory does not prevent me does not prevent me from having local currents. So, in other words, you can have these channels of what we call laminar current in my talk. You can have some positive currents and some negative currents, and all of them sum up to be zero. This is this is, does not violate the theory that Gerson is uh, uh, is is uh, mentioning. But what we have found is that in topological insulators, the current vanishes everywhere. There is no such a laminar current. It is not allowed, or at least out of this model, this is this never appears. Yeah. So there's no total current, and there's no local current either. So Gerson's theory that he mentions is saying that total current must vanish. But what I'm saying that in topological insulators, even the local current vanishes. Yeah. Okay. So do, so. I, I do have a question regarding that. Uh, I recall when I first uh, when I, I first did simulations of the BHZ model, I started looking at uh, uh, in the in the edge band. I started looking at k values away from uh, from from the center of the Brillouin zone from from pi from pi. And I saw that at some point, and that was already in the textbook. At some point, this uh, this edge mode would become a bulk mode. And uh, so, what you are saying is that there is a band that is a, it's a bulk band that has an edge mode. Is that what you are saying? And that is this 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 contribution of this bulk band to the edge that is uh, making the the current vanish, and nobody had noticed that. Actually. Uh, your question is more like, uh, let me see if I can reflect, rephrase this, your question. For instance, yes. uh, you can see these bands, right? It just gradually yeah. merges into the bulk bands. Yeah. So, and actually, I, I think I exchanged this some emails with, with another researcher. I was also trying to convince him that um, there's no clear distinct, distinct, uh, there's no clear distinction between the edge state and the bulk states because it just, you know, becomes part of bulk bands, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but then he was trying to argue that, okay, that's because I take this kind of lattice model of the finite width. 
if you do a kind of, uh, let's say, continuous model and you open up an edge, you discuss what is happening of the wave function near the edge, then you can actually calculate when it merges into the bulk bands exactly. So there's a, I forgot, how, yeah, I can't really give you a reference, but you, you, you can define how they eventually, how, how they touch each other. Yeah. Okay. If, you, if you consider infinitely semi-infinite system and you treat everything as a continuous model. Okay. And then I was re re replying to him that, okay, I can also go to this continuous model limit by just increasing the width of this uh, ribbon that I simulate, right? Yeah. And what, yeah. You found, what I have found is that this statement of cancellation of the edge current is independent from uh, what is the width that you have. They always cancel. So, so the the bulk bands they always cancel out the uh, edge state contribution. So, in other words, whatever you wanted to do to the edge states, the bulk bands knows. Yeah, the bulk band know, and they wanted to cancel it out exactly. Yeah, so, so it's a, it's a tiny contribution to the edge of each one of the bands that are farther below. Okay, okay, now I understand. Exactly, okay. exactly. so but what I mean to say is, although you might intuitively, you might think that, ah, it's a tiny, tiny contribution. But it so adds there, are, there are so many of them, you see. There are so many of these states. So collectively, they together cancels out your, okay. you know, your edge state contribution. Did you, did you, um, did, did you look for some general principle that could be behind of that, or yeah, because it's a very good question. Yeah, it's zero. It's zero. It's not a, a time. It's, it's rigorously zero at any parameters at any temperature. You can put in temperature into the Fermi function. Still zero. Um, so so far, I don't have an exact theorem. I mean. So far, I have a, I don't have an exact theorem why this is happening. So this is more like a numerical experiment. I found this to be true. Okay. Um, for instance, I have also been asked by other people that maybe this is because your system has a particle hole symmetry. I mean, the the rock Hamiltonian you start with is a particle hole symmetric uh, Hamiltonian. So maybe you should try. Maybe I should try to make it the particle hole asymmetric. Let's say put in next nearest neighbor hopping or something like that. Okay. Okay. So this I haven't done it yet. So, and also it's a little bit ambiguous how to do this in in topological insulator because you, yeah, it's it's a little bit ambiguous. So 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 I haven't done this yet. But uh, yeah, but so the short answer is I don't have a. Principle why this is happening. Okay, it's fine. So fine. Far it's a it's a very nice result though. Yeah. So um, Any any more questions? Um, yeah, I see that uh, Eduardo sent the um, The reference to you so uh, I, I have opened it. I will have a look okay. later. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, Edson, any more questions? Edson always likes to. Oh, George, can I? Yeah, Tom Tomé. Yeah, sure. Uh, Tomé has a, has a question. Hi, uh, hi Shen. Well, very nice talking. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have a, a, just a small question. Uh, uh, when you break time reversal symmetry and you show that left and the right are not equivalent, right? Uh, but by breaking time reversal, the topological states, the edge states, uh, also open a gap at the data crossing point, right? I couldn't see in your results a gap opening. Uh, I'm not sure if you included that in your, how that appears, it should be appear that, I, I couldn't see just that. So you see, uh, 
I think what you have in mind is that uh, let's say you, you you if you have a piece of topological insulator and you apply a magnetic field, mm -hmm. yeah, you get the crystal symmetry everywhere in the bulk, and then you open up a for sure. But what I'm doing here is that the topological insulator itself remains time virtual symmetric, but it is in proximity with uh, another piece of material that breaks the time reversal symmetry. So it is not, and in a way we, we explain this by, uh, let's say, so we use a lattice model. Perhaps we, I, I did not explain this uh, in detail, but we have basically a square lattice and a square lattice, and then we put them together like a sum hopping in between. So in this way, the topological is insulator itself has no magnetic field. It has no magnetization. It is proximitized with this material that has magnetization. And then I say that in this situation, you don't just open up a gap because the rigorously speaking, the topological insulator itself, well, itself remains, right? It's kind of like a, you have a piece of sample Part of it we preserves time reversal and part of it does not. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I say in this situation, you really have to look at the band structure and do you open up a gap? And then I say that no, it does not, at least in this model that we presented. So I, I say that generically, there are two kinds of situation, this kind of uh, pristine type, right? So you see that there's no gap. And then for this uh, submerged type, it is not even possible to separate them. Your whole your cone is just so, you know, just so, so much merged with this um, ferromagnetic bands. So, yeah, so in a way, we are studying a situation of proximity effect. So it's not really a direct breaking of the uh, time reversal symmetry on the topological insulator itself, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't know what's the a priori as well. We only did this situation and then we spend structure and then it seems that it makes sense to us. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, I have, uh, if nobody else has a question, I have a, I have a question. Uh, did you do the calculations for the nano ribbons for an armchair nano ribbon too, or yes, are you yes. planning to? Yeah. Okay. We also did that, and the conclusion is basically the same. So, for the sake of time, I did not show it, but. Uh, okay, okay. But so there, plus, there yeah. you don't have an edge state, right? For the. But exactly. That's the, that's the interesting thing that I am glad that you mentioned. So if I may uh, just emphasize this a little bit. Sure, sure. So what we have found is that, um, for instance, in the armchair, in the armchair uh, ribbon, now you gotta imagine, I'm, I'm, I'm opening uh, in the other way. I'm opening okay. the, the X and then, no, I'm opening condition, open boundary condition Y and continuous in X. So the band structure is very different from this uh, zigzag edge in, in the sense that you don't have these edge states anymore. You don't have this flat band, uh, this flat band edge states anymore. Nevertheless, all that I was saying still remains true. Mm -hmm. So and so you will still have a out of plane polarized helical edge spin current. And that is because you see that this edge spinker is not just contributed from the edge state. All the bulk bands are colored. Yeah, you see that whenever there's a blue, there's a green on the other side. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. So in a way that I'm emphasizing that um, it's kind of like in the topological insulator. So for this kind of equilibrium currents, you cannot just look at the edge states. You have to look at the whole. You have to you have to look at the whole bulk bands. Okay. Perfect. Very very interesting. Yeah, um, any more questions? I don't see anyone typing anything. So 
Uh, if we have no questions, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Right. Very nice thank talk. You thank you. Thank you. And the um, the uh, recording will be available uh, very soon. Right, Edson. Edson is the one who is uh, very kindly doing all this work of uh, setting up the uh, YouTube channel and having everything uploaded. And uh, thank you very much, Edson. So, um, okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, thank you okay. very much. And uh, we will be here next week again.